Hey guys, my name is Vishal and I welcome you all to yet another session by Dureka. In today's session, we are going to discuss some of the best practices that concern AWS, that is Amazon Web Services. But before we understand what those practices are, let's take a look at the offerings of today's session first. So here we would be discussing some of the best practices that concern AWS and those practices would concern these topics that is EC2 elastic cloud compute. Then we would understand some of the practices for IAM S3 that is a storage service some security best practices and finally some practices that concern billing as well. I hope this agenda is clear to you guys. So let's not waste any time and quickly get started then. So as we move further, we would be understanding what are some of the best practices for EC2 that is elastic cloud compute. Now again guys, if you are completely new to AWS that is Amazon Web Services, please go through the other videos that we have in our stack or in our playlist on YouTube. Probably those would hold you in a much better state to understand some of the terms that I would be using. As we move further, I would be talking about these terms as well, but we won't be getting into the depth of the terminologies here because we assume that the fact that you're here you have some understanding of what AWS is. So let's just move further and try to understand these practices. So when I say EC2, it is Elastic Cloud Compute, a computation service offered by AWS. Now, what does this service do? Well, basically what it does is it lets you create ROS servers on which you can host your websites and other applications that you have. So that is what EC2 stands for. So what are the practices that you can do to make sure that your AWS or your account or your infrastructure in general is in a better state. So these are some of the practices. AMI hardening is the first one. Now AMI Amazon machine image. What it does is if you have an EC2 server, basically what it does is it lets you make a copy of it, take an image of it and use it as a template to generate similar kind of instances. So what can you do with this template? Well, the first problem is if you are having an infrastructure or an application that has multiple instances in that case replicating your instances each time won't make a lot of sense because you need a secure and a more robust AMI. So can you define certain properties for it? Yes, you can actually define certain properties and harden your AMIs in a much better way. Say for example, you have your SSH which is nothing but your secured shell host. In that case, what you can do is you can change these hosts so that your account is more secure. Apart from that, you can ensure that you actually have proper IAM users and VPC accesses that are given to your so-called instance so that it is secure on a higher level or at a better level. VPC port location. Now, when I say VPC port location, a virtual private cloud as we know what it does is it brings in n number of instances under one umbrella that means you need these instances to communicate with each other as i've already mentioned you won't be dealing with one single instance right so in this case you want these instances to communicate and how do they do that you use vpc but what are the problems with vpc the major problem is security concern who gets to access your vpcs now basically what you can do is you can limit your IP addresses. It is advised that you block your IP addresses. You do not give any random IP address to access your VPC, but then there are certain VPCs which need to be accessed by certain IP addresses. In that case, you can make your ports or your VPCs open for certain IP addresses only. Private subnets. Now, all your applications should fall under private subnets. There is an exception. You have your load balancers and stuff like that, which do not fall under your private subnets, but you have to ensure that remaining stuff it falls under your private subnets and they are properly secured. Microservice architecture. Now what is a microservice architecture? Well, microservice architecture what it does is it helps you break down your architecture into simpler portions or simpler manageable services. Now to give you an example, suppose you have your e-commerce website something like Amazon. So you have so many verticals. I mean you have your payment billing your security your front end back end number of verticals that is the products that are sold different products for male female and stuff like that. So all these needs to be arranged into a more manageable system, right? So what happens here is instead of having one monolithic architecture for these individual verticals if you can have a different service that caters the need better on longer run. Why even if one vertical goes down the other verticals are working smoothly. That means these verticals aren't dependent on each other. 
So introducing this kind of architecture into AWS would definitely help because if suppose your billing goes down Maybe your login credentials or your login form still works So for people who just need to log in they can do that and for people who want to build probably they might have to wait But again at least one service is working. So that is what microservice architecture helps you do So implementing these kind of architectures also becomes important environment based keys now again when you talk about accessing your ec2 you cannot just go ahead and access your ec2 you need to give in some password details now how do you have or how do you get in your password details you do not log in with your username and id here when you create an instance with that you create a user key and its password those are called as your ssh keys again which are used to log into your instance so it is important that you have individual keys for your different environments you have key for your development environment you have one more key for your administrative environment what this does is suppose if i have a developer person i would give him access only to the dev environment because probably he or she is not concerned with the administrative environment and i do not want them to have that access so this helps me in better organization and keeping my resources safer so having environment based keys also work well and finally LDAP authentication now if I have n number of environment based keys I have n number of users and stuff like that So authenticating these logins or these user credentials can be a tedious task So instead of doing it manually there is something called as LDAP authentication that helps you automate this process and Saves you from the tedious efforts that you would otherwise put in so yes This also becomes an important practice when you talk about EC2. So yeah, these are some of the practices now let's move further and talk about something else IAM that is identification and access management basically now here as the name suggests what you do is you actually manage and govern the access given to the users that are using your AWS services so let us move further and take a look at some of the practices that ensure that IAM is taken care of properly roles for teams Again, I talked about the importance of having environment based keys. This is a little similar You should have roles defined in hierarchy so that you can give proper access to proper people Suppose I'm creating an IAM user for people who do not know what IAM user is it is nothing But it is a second level login where I do not give root access to everyone instead I give access to individuals where they have access to certain resources only so that is what an IAM user is so my root user would be having access to everything that happens But my IAM user would be having access only to certain resources So when you do assign these IAM roles or accesses to your individuals or employees If you have roles defined for your teams, you can know how much access to give to which individual That is why roles for teams actually play in very well So it is important one has a structured approach and proper roles defined for their teams Service specific access we've discussed this already if you are into development probably the services that concern development You should have access to only those services and accordingly should be your IAM user access given to you You should have read only access now. This is not true always now But yeah in some cases say for example you are a fresher maybe or somebody who has recently joined in the company And I do not want you as an individual to access all my resources or make changes to those Instead, I just want you to get a view of those so probably I would give you read-only access So probably you can understand everything that is happening, but cannot make any changes to the stuff that is there So read-only access also becomes important So when it comes to identification and access management, you need to follow these practices There are a couple of more but these are the important ones s3 practices. So what is s3 s3 stands for simple storage service now it is a storage service provided by AWS and what it does is it takes in your data in the form of objects and stores it in buckets or in containers which are called as buckets So what are the best practices that you can do or relate to s3? What you can do is you can have content specific names now Why do we need to do this what AWS does is it names its services or it not its services rather s3 What it does is in order to create s3 buckets what you have to do is you have to give Specific or unique names to your resources. So if there is a name that is already taken you cannot use it It is not allowed. So in that case you'd be forced to use longer names to give you an example Suppose if 
edureka does not work out you might be required to enter something like edureka certification edureka training so depending on that the size of your name would go much bigger than what you expect so in that case having content specific names helps say for example i am talking about an aws course maybe a masters course with edureka so probably my name should be something like edureka masters aws so it creates an hierarchy and what it also does is it makes it simple to understand the names so having this practice is actually a good habit create bucket policies again this becomes very important why is that now who needs to access your buckets it also becomes important what kind of data are you storing in that bucket and which people do you want to access your particular bucket so to control these things you need to give proper bucket access as well archive buckets to glacier now what is glacier let's first understand s3 a little more now s3 is a simple storage service which lets you store and retrieve data at standard pace but it is costlier compared to a service called as glacier now glacier again it lets you store data but it is specific for archival data and it is much cheaper why is that first understand archival data this data is data that you do not want to access every day to give you an example suppose i want my birth certificate for that i would have to go to a hospital right so if you remember the old school traditional method where we had everything put in papers probably if i did go there and tell them that give me my birth certificate after 25 years or my 30 years of my age what would happen there is probably they would tell me that you have to wait for maybe a couple of days couple of hours and then come back to take that document because that document is not retrievable right now so there are certain things where the data that is stored is not required frequently like in the case of my birth certificate right but if it was some medication or prescription that i took maybe from a medical store they would have a copy of it in the system right which i can readily take it right away why because probably that is more required information so try to relate this example with s3 and glacier your s3 is like your medical system where you get your data right away you go there you tell them i need this i had done this or this stuff so they would give you the data right away that yes this is the record we have but for my birth certificate it is more or it is similar to glacier where you store in data which you do not require frequently probably once in a lifetime or maybe five times in your life so similarly the data that you do not need every day i need it maybe once in a while i can put it in glacier so the fact that i cannot retrieve it right away it is cheaper so what best practice would be it is to move your s3 data to glacier in case if you are not using that data every day that would help you save a lot of money version your objects yes this is very important again when i say versioning your objects what i'm trying to symbolize or lay emphasis on is the fact that if you put in your data into your s3 bucket you can constantly make updates or keep a fresh copy of the recent update as in when you create a version you are stating that this is the recent entry to my data so what that does is in case if you want to go back you can go back to the freshest copy that you've stored so versioning also helps so these are some of the practices that concerns s3 so let's just move further and try to understand some of the security practices now if you talk about cloud computing people have always doubted whether cloud platforms are secure or not but that question or that debate has been put to rest a while ago people know that cloud platforms are very secure and these are some of the practices that ensure that your cloud platforms can be a lot more secure than what you think right now so what you should do is you should never share your root account credentials with anyone as i've already mentioned you have a root account using which you can create different iam users which can be assigned to people who have specific responsibilities so they would be answering or solving or having access only to those resources that they need so if you share your root account details with anyone probably they might misuse your resources and that might lead to hampering your overall security of the infrastructure so make sure that that does not happen remove unwanted users say for example somebody leaves your company now having an iam user with that credential won't be good because if that person still has access to those resources probably he can hamper you again enable two factor authentication yes you can have a number of other devices which generate four to six digit codes so once you do log in with the credentials if you are associated with these kind of applications probably this would ensure that the user has to log in twice and so that the system stays more secure than what it is already 
use IAM logins. Yes, now this again is important. I've already mentioned if you need users to have access to your resources, give them limited access. They need not have to have access to everything that is being used. So this is one practice which again becomes very important. Billing practices. So how can you optimize cost? Well, if you talk about cloud computing, it ensures that you don't pay a lot of money. I mean, because you're paying for the resources that you're using and only for the time duration you're using those resources. So the amount is very less. But still, at times when you talk about huge infrastructures and architectures, you might be forced to shell out a lot of money. So how do you prevent or how do you optimize this further? Well, there are certain practices. If you do implement those practices, definitely you can save a lot of money. One practice that you can do is billing budgets. Now what it does is you can pre-state, okay, I want to use these many resources for this duration of time. So AWS gives you a predefined budget. Okay, this is the amount you'd be paying and these are the resources you'd be using. So if you do set an alarm, AWS would alarm you saying that, okay, you are reaching a particular limit of your resources. Keep check of those resources. And this is where billing budgets help you a lot. What billing budget also does is it ensures that each individual service, it has its own proper billing budget as well. Say for example, S3 charges might be different. Your different services like EC2 and all if you have your certain servers running, your database is running. So in that case, the charges vary. So if you're using a particular resource, you'd be charged only for those resources. And accordingly, you can set budgets as well. So that helps you in the longer run. IAM billing. Yes, now billing access is given to few users only. You do not have IAM billing access in general to start with. But if you want certain users to have access to your billing so that they can help you better plan your expense and maybe help your organization with the finance stuff, probably you can have some IAM users having certain billing accesses as well. Multiple credit card payments. Now what AWS does is it gives you a facility where you can have multiple credit cards linked with your account. So if you're using a particular credit card and while paying the bill you reach its limit, you might switch to the other credit card as well. This again helps in the longer run. Regional taxation. Yes, now based on the reason where you are based in, your taxes might vary. But in general, if you allocate this particular service, now there is a tab available in your billing department where you can activate this notion and once you do that AWS keeps track of all the resources that you've used and the money you've paid. So when you're filing your ITR income tax returns that is probably you can always put in the details given by AWS. You can generate a copy of it and say that I've paid my money here. So probably that would help you with the taxation part as well. And finally you should have multi account consolidation. Now this is opposite of what we discussed in the third pointer not opposite but a little contradicting to that point and how is that well when you talk about multi account consolidation what it says is if you have multiple resources or that are linked to each other if you want to pay them in one go instead of paying them individually you can have those resources consolidated in one place and have a consolidated billing account for it. So when a bill is generated instead of paying maybe four or five bills one by one, you can do it in one go paying all of them added together. So yeah, these are some of the best practices that concern billing and more or less these were the practices I wanted to talk about. If you do have any other practices that you feel are worth mentioning, probably you can put those in the comment section below and we would also like to make a note of that as well. As far as this particular session goes guys, I would be resting it here and here. Thank you. Bye bye. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!